فعاش القلب إخلاصا وافرت تحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روبا الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى we send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them, to bless every one of us and our offspring to come up to the end. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all Jannatul Firdaus through his mercy. Ameen. My beloved brothers and sisters, I wish to dive straight into the topic seeing that time is of essence. But alhamdulillah, now that we have completed Salatul Maghrib, I think it's loose-ended. If we miss the flight, it's okay, we can have another convention tomorrow by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, none of us will taste contentment and happiness until we are concerned about others as much as we are concerned about ourselves. Remember that. I repeat, none of us will taste true contentment and happiness until we do not care for others, until we do not show that concern for others. In fact, none of us will actually be able to taste the goodness of Iman until we have the goodness amongst one another in a way that each one is taken care of. It's not about me. If it's all about me, I will never be able to get goodness. And remember, I'm basing this on a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he says, لا يؤمن أحدكم None of you would be considered true believers unless and until حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه Until and unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. You love for the other what you love for yourself. You would like to have fresh water, fresh air. You would like to have uh, goodness in terms of your surroundings. You want things to be clean. You want to have food and accommodation. You want to have so much of goodness. You need to know that in order to be considered a true believer, you need to have a concern for others as well. It's not just about yourself. When you are selfish, you will never achieve contentment. And why I say contentment and happiness is because Without Iman, what type of contentment and happiness would you like to have? Now why is it that the Prophet ﷺ speaks about Iman? And he says, if you don't become selfless, you are not considered true Muslimin, true Mu'mineen actually, true believers. Because to believe in Allah would also include to believe that Allah has created entire creation. Those you like, those you don't like. Those who agree with you, those who don't agree with you. All of them were created by Allah. The animals that you actually perhaps can consume if they were to be made halal and those that you cannot consume no matter what condition it is. So all of those you need to understand Allah created them. There is a purpose. There is a reason. You need to know what is the reason. <laughs> Allah says, I have not created mankind or jinn kind except that they worship me, they obey my instruction, they understand the way of life that I have chosen for them and they fulfill it. So part of that belief and part of the worship of Allah is to acknowledge that Allah is the creator of everything. He made the non-Muslims, He made the Muslims, He made the tall and the short, the dark and the fair, those of different places of the globe, Allah made them. I need to think for a moment. I I'm just a number, a figure. I fit in somewhere. I need to be concerned about others. And wallahi, when a wealthy person shares his wealth, that's the only time he will receive and achieve true happiness and the real smile. But when he keeps his wealth to himself, it means nothing. Yesterday I received a call from someone saying, my father is very wealthy. He has given wealth to his sons. But for me as a daughter, I'm struggling in my marriage. And my father says, no, your husband must take care of you. Yet, even if he were to be fair with us, we would actually be well off today. Fair, meaning I don't want him to give me more than what he's given the brothers. But the attitude is no. 
I am too proud, haughty, arrogant, without saying it obviously, without even admitting it, to be able to give my daughter in a way that my son-in-law can benefit. Why? Because he's a son-in-law. Why must he benefit? Allahu Akbar. What attitude is it? Is he not more closely related to you than the rest of the globe? Yet Allah tells you to be kind to the entire globe and not just to your own family members, those whom you think are the males or those whom you feel proud to be giving. For what? Now, I started off with this introduction because if we go back into the history, we are talking about the best of generations. The Prophet Muhammad says, Khayrun nasi qarni. We've heard this hadith so many times today. The best of people, my generation. So we will go back and take examples from that generation, subhanallah. But the introduction was connected to encouraging me to share what I have. That's why we are here in Zamboanga with the whole team because we want to share what we have. There is goodness. The highest goodness we have is Iman, subhanallah. I'm sharing it. We are sharing it with each other. I am open to correction just like any one of us should be. And the same would apply to all my colleagues and everyone else. If someone would like to share the goodness that they witnessed or saw and would like to protect us from a weakness or a mistake, they need to care for us such that they correct us lovingly, kindly. This is why a person who corrects you in an arrogant way Sometimes their intention can be questioned because of their arrogance. But if you're genuine, you will not have that problem. You will always be kind. You will make sure that you love people. You talk to them in a way you would like to be spoken to. You actually cover their faults in a way you would like your faults to be covered and so on. So we have one of the best women ever to exist. One of the group known as the best women ever to exist. Subhanallah. She was born in a beautiful family in Makkah al Mukarramah, quite a well to do family, mashallah. She was born in a well to do family. She had brothers, she had sisters, etc., etc. She had a family. She had cousins, she had uncles, aunts, and she was well respected as she grew up. Subhanallah, she became known as a businesswoman, very intelligent, with great integrity, and so on. Who was she? She was known in the early years as at tahira Is that the same person we're talking about? She was known as at tahira the one who is pure, the one who is clean. Not just purity of the external self, but purity internally as well. She had a good heart, she loved people, she cared for them. She picked up those who were honest and those who were of integrity. She honored them in her own way. She reached out to the poor and the needy. Even prior to her connection with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she was known as a Tahira. Remember that. I'm sure some of you might have names Tahira. Well, now you know there is a connection, right? But her, her true name was Khadija binti Khuwaylid ibn Asad radiyallahu anha. Khadija binti Khuwaylid ibn Asad. I've tried to do something of late. And that is, when you say the name of a Sahabi, don't just say two, go to the third. Learn the third name also. So we always say Khadija binti Khawailid, right? Now let's go one more and say Khadija binti Khawailid ibn Asad. So we have the Asad as well. And the same applies to all of us. If you know your grandfather and great-grandfather, and perhaps great-great-grandfather, now it's time to get to know two or three more greats in your name by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... She was an amazing woman. And you know what? Getting straight to the point, the selflessness was a quality that Allah chose her for. She became one of the greatest pillars of support, not just for Muhammad wasallam, but for Islam. Today we are seated here because of the sacrifice of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu. She was one of the first. Radiallahu anha. We say her name and very happily and proudly after that we say, May Allah be pleased with her. Radiallahu anha. May Allah be pleased with all of us too. Amen. So, my brothers and sisters, what a great woman. Normally we speak about women, right? And people sideline the women. And people say, Oh, Islam oppresses women. Not at all. Islam gives you a position. Learn about it. Understand it. Behave in that way that you live such that people acknowledge your level. What's the point of saying Islam made me very high, but you're busy doing bad things, subhanallah. What's the point of saying Islam has raised me and you don't even want to dress appropriately, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us guidance. So when we say Islam has raised us, live in a raised way. 
Subhanallah. Live in a way that people when they look at you, they can see that you are a person of integrity, respect, care, honor, dignity, etc. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. So Khadija binti Khawaydi radiallahu anha, there came a time in her life when it was pointed out to her that as she was employing men to take her caravans and her business dealings and to head her caravans to different parts of the region, she were, was looking for different people who were considered honest. And someone told her that there is this man, Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Hashimi al-Qurashi sallallahu At the time, he was not yet granted nubuwa by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he was an honest man. He was known as As-Sadiq al-Amin amongst his people. Do you know that? As-Sadiq al-Amin. So in his early 20s, he was identified by this lady. She was 15 years older than him. I'm sure we've heard this. This is according to the, the majority of narrations. There is a small, perhaps, uh, number of scholars who s speak about slightly different age, but they all agree she was older than him. She was older than him. Guess what? She decided to call this man and to give him the slave boy known as Maysara and to give him merchandise and to instruct him what to do, what not to do. Subhanallah. How many of the women here are business women? Put up your hand. Business women, mashallah. Mashallah. Yeah, I can see quite a number. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us barakah in our business. Here is a lady who employed with full respect Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imagine. Think about it. I don't want to go into the rulings of employing a male, etc., etc. But that is a topic on its own. Today we are talking of selflessness. So I'm going to move into it. But there is a lot to be learned from this. She gave the instruction to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as the one who employed him as to what to do. And he went out with Maysara. And he had such a successful trip that when he came back, Maysara told her, you know what, I've never seen such a great man. Everyone was praising him. In fact, one of the rabbis said this man is going to be a prophet and something else happened and something else happened. So many things. And I've seen miracle upon miracle. His attitude, his way of speaking, his mannerism, his accountability, his dignity, his respect and so on. You know what? In a short space of time, because of the large profit that was made, she understood this man is blessed. He has great qualities. So against all odds, she decided to do something. Now there are two, three different narrations how exactly she married Muhammad Wasallam, But there was a proposal made from her side. It came from her side. Now according to Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, according to the narrations we have, she was married before twice. She was married before twice. One completely confirmed. She was widowed. She was a widow. Subhanallah. She already had children. She already had children. She was a widow. And then there is a narration that says she married Aqil, who was the second husband, and either widowed or divorced from him as well. So twice married. In our communities, a woman marries once and is divorced. I think a lot of men wouldn't even look in that direction. Am I right? They wouldn't look in that direction. They would consider themselves, Oh, Wallahi, you may not know, that might be your Khadija, Subhanallah. It might be your Tahira, Subhanallah. May Allah grant us ease and goodness. It is to do with the qualities of a person. It's possible that she was the best woman who couldn't get along with someone else or for whatever reason they may have been. We don't know. We were not given details and that's the way it should be. You didn't get along with someone, divorce from them. You say, look, good person, perhaps we didn't get along. We were two good people, but we thought differently. We had different, for example, aiming in different directions, whatever it was, we didn't get along. Against all the odds, number one, she was older by approximately 15 years, according to the bulk of narrations. Number two, married twice. Now, number three, a young man. Very good looking, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhanallah, a man known as blemishless, no blemish. He was not interested in all the desires and you know, the glamour of the dunya, no. She decided, let me 
you know, get the proposal across. Like I told you, there are two or three different narrations, but the proposal went across and guess what? It was accepted, subhanallah. It was accepted. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam married Khadija binti Khawalid radiallahu anha. She was honored. She was so happy. And subhanallah, they lived for 24 and a half years together. How many years? 24 and a half years. Remember that almost 25 years. She is the wife whom he lived with the longest. No one else did he live with as long as that. The others were a few years. This was almost 25 years. No problems, no hassles, no arguments, no fights. All his children from her besides one, Ibrahim, from Maria Al-Qibtiya radiallahu anha. So she was a woman older than him. But there was so much of respect. Do you know what she did? Now we get to the selfless part, mashallah. Her marriage to him was in order to be able to serve this man, great man, and later to serve the deen. Perhaps she was not aware of exactly what was going to come in her direction, but she was a noble woman. She had a cousin called Waraka ibn Nawfal. He was a person who had become a Christian at some stage and he learned a lot from the scriptures and she used to go to him. Who used to go to him? The cousin Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. She used to go to him prior to Islam in the period of Mecca. She was born in Mecca. She used to go to him and she used to ask about her dreams, about her ideas, her thoughts, get some guidance from him and so on. So much so that the day the prophethood came, she did something quite similar. We're going to get to that. But before that, she was given a gift of some slaves. We know at that time slavery was rampant. What happened? She decided to choose a young boy known as Zayd ibn Haritha. This Zayd ibn Haritha was a good looking young boy. And she saw the Prophet ﷺ as a husband. She said, you know what, I'm giving you a gift. The Prophet ﷺ says, you're giving me a gift. This boy as a slave, I am freeing him and I am adopting him as my own son. At that time, prior to Islam, it was okay. Meaning people used to do that. It was not yet prohibited. Adoption, the way the West knows it, is not some Islamic idea. It's not Islamic. But... We would look after orphans, we would take care of people without taking their true identity away from them. So in Islam, it's more like taking care of someone who belongs to Allah, but you have developed a relationship of sponsoring them, helping them, assisting them, treating them as your own, etc. Knowing that and explaining to them too, that you know what, you are actually the child of someone else, but we love you equally. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. It's a topic on its own. But it's not easy to look after a child who is not yours. A young boy considered a slave. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not tolerate having a slave. He said, no, let this child be free. The child was freed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He was known at that time as Zayd ibn Muhammad, but he was not the son of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Later on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses, أُدْعُوهُمْ لِآبَائِهِمْ هُوَ أَقْسَطُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Call them with their father's names. It is more just in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he was always then known as Zayd ibn Haritha. Now, that was not the only child that she looked after. She started taking care of the child. And yes, he was a servant. He used to serve the Prophet ﷺ. He loved the Prophet ﷺ so much that when his father came around, he chose to remain with the Prophet ﷺ and not to go with his own father. Similarly, you know the Prophet ﷺ had an uncle. What was the uncle's name? Abu Talib. He had a few uncles. One of the uncles, the most common, his name was Abu Talib. He had, a, he had many children and he was a poor man. Listen, O oh people of Zamboanga, listen very carefully. The Prophet ﷺ had an uncle called Abu Talib. His uncle had children who were now his cousins, many children, and the uncle was a poor person. The Prophet ﷺ decided to go to his uncle and say, Oh my uncle, you've got many children, let me take care of one completely. You cannot afford it, you are struggling. <laughs> 
How many of us would look after our brothers and sisters' children, let alone uncles and aunts? Look at the selflessness. It required the wife to be in sync with Muhammad sallallahu and she was. She took great care of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. He grew up in the house of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Did you ever know that? Subhanallah. He was brought up by Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi This was Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. What a great man. Amazing. And he's not the only one. There is another one. Subhanallah. Al-Awwam ibn Khuwaylid was the brother of Khadija bint Khuwaylid. He had a son called Az-Zubair. Az-Zubair ibn Al-Awwam ibn Khuwaylid. I told you add a third name, it will help you a lot. Az-Zubair ibn Al-Awwam ibn Khuwaylid was brought up by Khadija bint Khuwaylid radiallahu anha in the same house as Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anha. Did you know that? She was married to Safiya bint Abdul Muttalib. So he was brought up in a home where he was related from all angles. How many of us are prepared to look after the orphans within our own families? Many of us, wives and husbands, we wouldn't like to take care of the children of others. Where is the quality? We want to be like Khadija. We want to be like Aisha radiallahu anhuma. We want to be like everyone else, but where is the quality? Come on, open your heart. It's not about you, you and you alone. No, it's about every one of us. Take care of each other. Look after the others. Help someone cross the road and see what happens. That's a simple example. Feed someone some food. You have wealth. What are you going to do with that wealth? Where is it going to go? Spend it. Spend it on your family, on your children, on your relatives, on the needy. See what happens. Spend it on good causes like this. We'd like to see the wealthy sponsor entire conventions of this nature such that we don't need to have a ticket charge for every person to be able to contribute towards a convention of this nature. Although it is an honor if your 200, 500, 1000 pesos were taken for such an august gathering. Beautiful gathering with lovely people, honorable dignitaries all around, all around us. We have come here only for the sake of Allah to listen to something that will move us. We need to be moved. Your heart needs correction, rectification. The only way it's going to get true rectification is by going back to those Qurun, those best of people that the Prophet ﷺ bore witness about. And do something about it. It's not about me. How good do you make others feel? The Prophet ﷺ, when he greeted children, he gave them a smile, he gave them a moment, he gave them time, he made them feel important. In other words, he empowered them. Just the child. How? Those are the leaders of tomorrow. We don't even greet children, we don't even notice kids. When the child makes a noise, I remember on the aircraft, there was a baby. By default, it happens a lot. You know, with the pressure going up and coming down, a baby screaming and yelling, and you see all the people looking back. <laughs> it could have been your baby, my baby, everybody's baby. I got up and said, ma'am, I have nine kids. Don't worry, it's absolutely normal. Wah! It's okay, scream, yell. That's your job, man. Subhanallah. It's normal. We, we cannot tolerate... The sound of a crying baby, let alone help people. Allahu Akbar. Look how low we've become. Wallahi. Someone's crying. We're not even interested. Why are they crying? Yes, we won't be able to help everyone in a way they want. Because now you might get a few wise cracks at the door saying, you heard about selflessness, right? I need a million. I can't help you. You see? Where's your heart? Where's your quality? Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. So we don't want that type of attitude where we... Take advantage wrongly of the advice that is being given to everyone as a whole. But rather each one of us look into our own hearts. Here is a woman I've only started talking about. She looked after the children of others and she had her own children as well. 
Subhanallah. Thereafter, let me explain. She served Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. She continued serving him when he used to go up for meditation in Hira, and she was a wealthy woman. She never told him, "I'm rich, you're poor." Allahu Akbar. Never, because if she was wealthy in terms of material wealth, he was the wealthiest in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa taala in every way. Money alone is nothing. It's the blessing in the money that is everything. You don't have it, then even if you have the millions and the billions, with all the zeros right up to the end, it will mean nothing. It won't help you or deliver you from any evil. So my brothers and sisters, she used to go to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam with some food. She used to talk to him. She used to comfort him. Now let's get to the point where wahi came, revelation came. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam sitting. In the cave of Hira, Jibril alayhi salam came to him. We know of the story of Iqra, the first words, right? Revelation. We've spoken about it before. When that first revelation came to him, his heart was thumping. Subhanallah. He ran down, and first person he went to was Khadija bint Khuwaylid radhiyallahu anha. He said, "Zamiluni, zamiluni. You know, cover me." Embrace me, and you know, give me that tight hug. Subhanallah. You know that shows the relationship. There are very few men who would actually go to their wives first thing first, and tell them, "I need comfort. Something has just happened." They would rather keep it a secret. No, wife, wife, me tell my wife. Are you crazy? Astaghfirullah. I hope we don't think. I'd rather tell my girlfriend. A'udhu billah. A'udhu billah. <laughs> but that's the attitude of people today. We don't think straight, and we don't trust each other. We haven't served each other. We're all in it for ourselves. That's what it is. You're in the marriage because of you. You want it yourself. I remember. I heard of a, a, a marriage recently that was broken, totally broken, before the walima took place. Over what? An argument as to whose car we should go into after the walima. Wallahi, I'm not joking. People are hearing this perhaps all over the world. They would know where it was and who who did it. What an embarrassment! What are we in there for? We cannot sacrifice. I would say, don't use a car. Go walking. Subhanallah. Go walking. So what? If they're fighting about whose car to go into, you rather just go walking. Get wet in the in the rain and see. It's romantic, isn't it? As it is, mashallah. That's the best way of spending the first night in the rain, mashallah. May Allah grant us ease. So he comes to his wife Khadija bint Khawailid ibn Asad radhiyallahu anha, and he says, "You know what? This is what has just happened." She says, "Kalla wallahi ma yuzi kallahu abdan." It's impossible for Allah to let such a great man down. How many of our wives or husbands can declare the spouse to be a great person? If they can, they are truly great. I've said this in the past in the same hall, where I've said the person who knows you the best, your spouse, and those whom you live with. That's why khayru khayrukum khayrukum li ahlihi. The best from amongst you are those who are best to your family members, your spouse. Why? If they can bear witness that you are good, you are really good. The rest of the people only see you good behavior, mashallah. They only see you part of the day, one two hours. You can actually pretend like you're a great person to others, but when they see you morning, afternoon, evening, night, when you just get up, when you sick, when you unwell, when you've come out of the bathroom, etc., etc., when you're going into the bathroom, subhanallah. When you leave your room and see what type of a mess it is. And see what attitude and lip you give the people. Subhanallah, they would know your value and your worth if they can say, "Good man, you are a good man." May Allah make us from those. Don't just listen to what I'm saying. Think about it and tell yourself, "I'm going to become like this. I want to be a person." And listen, my brothers, my sisters, you have a spouse. May Allah bless you. You don't have a spouse. May Allah still bless you with a spouse who will be the coolness of your eyes. Work on your marriage. Work on your relationship very hard. Do not allow the distractions of the devil to lead you away from good people who are already with you in marriage, and you can't see their goodness because of your own evil. We cannot see the goodness of our spouse because we are evil. 
People have a dark hidden side to themselves, a dirty part of themselves. For that, they cannot see such a great spouse in front of them. They cannot praise the spouse, they can praise everyone else. Here's the woman saying straight to the man, Wallahi, you're a good man. You look after the neighbors, you take care of the orphans, you help people in need. You, you've never sworn, you haven't done anything bad, you're a great man. Allah will not let you down, impossible. She's saying with so much confidence, because she knows great man, whatever comes in your direction can only be good. Then she says, hang on, I take you to this man I know is knowledgeable, the cousin, Waraka bin Nawfal. She took Muhammad sallallahu to Waraka bin Nawfal. It was out of care and concern that she took him to Waraka. Care, look, this is what has happened to my husband. He's a great man. He just heard a little bit of it and he said, you know what? That's an angel. He is the same one that came to the other prophets. And if this is the case, then you know what? I'd like to be there the day you are driven away and out of your community. So Muhammad sallallahu looks at him and says, you mean my community will drive me out of my community? He says, yes. Everybody who has come with what you are about to come with has been fought. Rudi, Rudi means they, there was enmity against them. And this is why we consider it an honor when people don't like us simply because we're Muslim. It happened to people better than us before us. Why must I get excited? I need to keep on proving that I am, this is what Islam is, this is what Islam stands for. It, it doesn't stand for the violence and the killing and the hatred and everything that people perhaps say it stands for. No, it stands for goodness, respect, dignity, honor. It stands for firm belief and conviction in Allah and Allah alone. It stands for worshipping Allah and Allah alone, not rendering acts of worship to sticks or stones or people. No, we worship Allah, we glorify Allah, we don't glorify the creatures of Allah, but we respect the creatures of Allah. Because they are creatures of Allah. That's the Islam. So don't be embarrassed if someone were to laugh at you just because you have a scarf on your head and then you take it off and say, they laughed at me, so I took it off. Well, that was your test. The test is they will laugh at you, they will mock at you, they will pressurize you. If you still have it on your head, subhanAllah, you are the winner. When you wrote one plus one equals two and they laughed at you and they laughed again and they scoffed and they all looked at you and they gathered around you and they laughed and you kept on writing one plus one is two, one plus one is two. Do you really think a day will come when their laughter will make you write one plus one is three just because they wanted you to write three then? Well, that's what we're doing with Islam. When we know what is right, but because of people and their pressure and their laughter and whatever else they have to say, sometimes we're giving up the deen. Just because others are saying things and you know it's wrong. You know what they're saying is wrong. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So he says, I wish and I pray that I will be there the day you are sent to your people and the day your people will drive you out. But unfortunately he passed away between that wahi and the next wahi. According to the narrations, Waraka bin Nawfal was a very old man, although he was the cousin of Khadija, radiallahu anha, he passed away. Now comes a time, and I'm fast forwarding, when Quraysh had now decided that they want to boycott the Muslims in a place known as Shi'ab Abi Talib. So they boycotted them. Khadija bint Khawailid ibn Asad was a powerful woman, wealthy woman from a noble family, radiallahu anha. She decided, I'm joining my husband. She decided, I'm joining my husband. For three whole years, they were in an area known as Shi'ab Abi Talib. There was a boycott against them. Not one day did she complain. There was no food, there was no drink. There was nothing. There was a time when the companions say, we used to suck on the roots of the trees in order to get liquid into our bodies. No complaint. No complaint. How many of us complain about small things? The exact fruit juice that you love is not available in the market, so there is a qiyama in your home. Yes. The type of makeup you use suddenly is no longer there. So what happens? It's like the trumpet is blown in your own home. Everything comes down. Relax, relax. 
I always tell people the best makeup is that which is absolutely natural from Allah given to you. The day you are proud of that is the day you have really and truly arrived on a new level of connection with Allah. Just remember those words. Be happy with what Allah has given you. Some of us are such. May Allah forgive us. I don't even like to say this, but every time, you know, I am in my 40s, okay? And I can tell you, when we were young, Wallahi, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, makeup was not treated as it is today. Wallahi. Today, your identity is changed. People won't recognize you. And people are thinking, you know what, it's a good thing. Wallahi, a lot of these chemicals, we, we, we are stoned because we say the chemicals are bad, they're not good for your skin, they're not good for this. And we are stoned. People say, look at these guys, these sheikhs, what are they promoting and preaching? We are just telling you to love yourself as you are. Because if you don't, soon, you're going to want to change every single thing there. Subhanallah. You won't be happy. And you'll die not being happy. Your life is only 60 to 70 years if you're lucky. Nowadays, people are dying earlier. Every other day we're hearing of cancer, cancer, cancer. May Allah grant cure to those who have cancer. But there is a problem. We don't know exactly what it is. Some are saying it might be the mobile device. Some are saying it might be the food. Genetically modified. Whatever it may be. But it's there. People are dying younger and younger. Let's not fool ourselves. Life is too short. Please Allah. Serve the people and you will earn the pleasure of Allah. Become selfless. Don't think all about yourself. Come on, I don't mind whatever. So long as I'm presentable, alhamdulillah, you like me for who I am. You know, in Islam, one of the reasons why hijab is prescribed is in order for you not to be judged based on appearance, but rather based on you, your character, your conduct, your service, your whatever else you are and what you stand for, not on your looks. Someone is dark, they are ashamed of their darkness. Someone is slightly, you know, uh, I don't want to say overweight, but, but bigger. Why I don't say overweight is because even if you are 200 kilos, there might be a guy saying, wow, 200 kgs, ooh. You know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. You will find someone who likes you by the will of Allah. But we've become such that one kg, 500 grams more on that scale. And again, subhanallah, it's like no one can even go near mama. Why? Because 500 grams, where did it come from? Well, it's all those, what do they call them? Lokotokos that you're eating. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really grant us ease. Think about the bigger picture. Think about the bigger picture. Here is the great woman, Khadija bint Khawailid radiallahu anha. She went with her husband. When she didn't have to go, she went, she joined him in this place to serve him, to make sure. And she had children of her own. Her children passed away one after the other. Do you know that? Her boys, they passed away. Her girls, subhanallah, they passed away later on. But her boys in her life, the girls in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, besides one, Fatima binti Muhammad radiallahu anha, she passed away a little bit after Muhammad ﷺ's passing on. She didn't complain. Never. She was a happy woman, content. Look at what you have. You have water, you don't have fruit juice. Others don't even have water. Others don't even have water. You have food, you have something to put in your mouth. Wallahi, there are people yesterday, they were living in better conditions than you. Today, they are living in worse conditions than you. May Allah grant all those who are struggling across the globe ease. Whether they are in Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan or Libya or Yemen, wherever they are on the globe, wherever they are, even our brothers and sisters in, in Indonesia who have suffered, whether in Lombok or the, the earthquake that happened last night and the tsunami, we ask Allah to grant ease to those of our brothers and sisters who were affected. It is very possible for that to happen to us, very possible. Reach out to others, Allah will reach out to you. Remember that. Allah will continue to assist his worshipper for as long as that worshipper continues to assist another. Remember that. Don't lose focus. You want help? I remember from the time we were young, we were always told if you want help, help those who need similar help. Subhanallah, amazing. We don't have the time. We don't have the time. So here is this great woman. She comes back. She supported Muhammad 
And you know what? The tenth year of prophethood. The tenth year of prophethood. Now it's 24 and a half years later. A little while after the death of Abu Talib, who was the uncle of Muhammad Sallallahu whose son they looked after, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, Khadija bint Khawaylid radiallahu anha fell ill. She fell ill during the time of the boycott. And she passed away thereafter. When she passed away, the Prophet ﷺ was very, very sad. Very sad. Such that that year was known as Amul Huzn, the year of sadness. The year of sadness. Because the Prophet ﷺ lost his uncle. And he lost his wife. And he went to Ta'if. And they treated him very badly in Ta'if. One, two, three things started happening, subhanAllah, that were negative. He didn't complain. In fact, he says, Oh Allah, I'm weak. You've asked me to do something. Here the people are, they're not even listening to what I have to say. My brothers and sisters, we are the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Be proud of the fact that you are Muslimin, but work towards adopting the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in your lives. Remember two things we need to develop. Your relationship with Allah and your relationship with the rest of the creatures of the same Allah. We, many of us develop one. We become pious according to us because we fulfill salah. But we swear people. We cheat. We deceive. We hurt people. We are abusive. We accuse people. We no longer think good about people. We think the worst thing. If someone does something, you think the worst thing about them rather than thinking a good thing about them. Where is the goodness? It's called husnul dhan. Husnul dhan means to think good about someone when something has happened that might have a negative side to it, but you thought of the positive side. That's called husnul dhan. Khadija bint Khawail radiallahu anha, she had sacrificed so much for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that after her death, he used to treat her friends with utmost respect right up to the end. Aisha radiallahu anha also says that the Prophet sallallahu at times when he used to get things or when there was a sacrificial animal, he used to send some of the meat to the friends of Khadija. And he used to say, that was the friend of Khadija. Subhanallah. Look at the treatment. Look at the honor. Look at the dignity, the respect. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu says that she was one of the best women. Khadija bint Khawailid ibn Asad radiallahu anha. He mentions three others. He mentions Fatima bint Muhammad radiallahu anha. He mentions Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun. And he mentions Maryam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam, Ibn Imran. The Prophet says, these four women, they are of the highest level of the women. May Allah grant us all paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for every one of us. My brothers and sisters, I've touched on a few aspects of this great, great, role model of all of ours, male and female. There is a lot more that you need to read about this great leader of ours. When I say leader, I mean in terms of being a role model, subhanallah. She cared for her husband. She served her husband. She was wealthier indeed. And Muhammad ﷺ never married over her, which means when she was the wife, she was the only wife. And as I told you right at the beginning, he chose someone, not looking at whether she was married before or not, looking at her character, her conduct, her dedication, and so on. And she expressed as well that I'd like to marry you based on character, conduct, your, the way you speak, your honesty, and so on. May Allah make us from those who can revive that beautiful era known as Khairul Qurun, the best of people, the best of nations. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless every one of us. You notice today we didn't really have time to crack any jokes. But that's fine, inshallah. We'll keep that for next time. Because time was not on our side, mashallah. But I'm sure my brothers and colleagues did a good job. You know, brother Wail, the last time in Marawi, I said he was a teddy bear. You guys remember? Now he came back with a vengeance and he lost all that teddy part of him. He lost the teddy part of him. And then guess what? 
It happened when he shifted to Australia. It happened when he shifted to Australia. So I agree, brother Wahid, the teddy part of it is gone because subhanallah, you look slimmer than me, mashallah. But the bear part of it is still there. I think you now can be called a koala bear, inshallah. Koala, coming from Australia, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless every one of us. I've really enjoyed it with my brothers and sisters here. Please forgive me for my own shortcomings. And if I've gone wrong in anything, I would expect you out of your love for all of us to be able to correct me also. And the same would apply to the others. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanakallahu wa bihamdi. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.